Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Janet and Jerry Sutter on the podcast. Suter? Suter, yep. Suter. 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 Sorry about that. Suter on the podcast. They have a new book written called Selling Americans on America, Journey into a Troubled Nation. It's all about the Freedom Train, which for any of you guys who don't know, it's a train that toured through 48 states and visited over 300 cities and towns and involved more than 40 million people. It started in 1947. And it had documents such as the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, Emancipation Proclamation, the Treaty of Paris, the Federalist Papers, and the Mayflower Compact on it. It had a lot of interesting documents on it. And it's just such a great overall story. But first of all, I got to ask, what inspired you guys to get into this topic and start writing about the Freedom Train? Well, actually, we were looking for a project. We uh, have written over 50 books, of histories and biographies. And uh, we had hit a little bit of a dry period. And I had a book called Chronicles of American Life from 1910 to about 1922. And we were had always been kind of curious about what was going on immediately following World War II. Uh, we had the 50s. We knew about McCarthyism, the Korean War, etc. And I came across the year 1947, in which they listed the American Freedom Train traveled across the country carrying documents, historic documents, and was viewed by millions of people. I thought, I never heard of this. Jerry never heard of it. We thought, I wonder if there's a book about it. And we looked up. There weren't any books. There were a few papers that were written on it. There were chapters in books about the 40s, but no book just about that train itself. And we were immediately curious, started doing research. We were able to get into uh, newspaper articles about it. And uh, from there on, it just grew. Yeah, we we didn't understand. Most people didn't understand that the uh, United States was in kind of a tough pickle right after World War II. Uh, we'd won the war, but we weren't winning the peace. The country was divided. We had a Congress that wasn't doing anything. Stop me if you've seen, if you've heard this before. We had a Congress that wasn't doing anything. We had a president that nobody respected or knew because he wasn't elected. He came, Harry Truman came on after Roosevelt. We had Office of Price uh, Management was still rationing foods because they hadn't switched over to civilians yet. Same thing, you couldn't buy a car, you could buy a tank, but you couldn't buy a car. And so we had problems with that. And then we had the GIs coming back from Europe, and the GI Bill was promising them an education so they could step up a bit and, and take care of the years they'd missed, but they didn't weren't promised a job. And at the same time, we had a flood of refugees coming in across our borders from Eastern Europe, this time in Western Europe, that had been devastated by World War II. So all of these things were hitting our country at the same time, and we already had segregation that didn't end when the black segregated soldier and the black soldiers came back. They just found exactly what they had left. When, and we had one more thing, too, that was creeping communism was just starting up because Stalin had just taken over Russia and he was a dictator and he was pushing out, gobbling up everything he could find over in Europe. And those people were fleeing. And guess where they fled? It was right here. And so we had our borders and that. And so we saw things that were mirroring a lot of the stuff that we're living in today. We thought, well, this should resonate with a lot of people. Yeah, one of my first ever history guests was a guy who wrote a biography on Joseph Stalin. So we had him, had him come on and talk. So you mentioning that, yeah, I mean, that's just it's just such a fascinating period. I mean, I had a great uncle. He's still alive, and he was a World War II veteran. Just talking about, you know, after the war, how how weird, how just struggling it was because all these people had died, and still, you know, everyone's now trying to use their GI bills to get into college. I mean, it was just a really just a fascinating time to live in. But one thing that I found really interesting, because you talked about how, you know, segregation was still a thing, is that the exhibit, when they did it, was integrated. I mean, they allowed blacks and whites to view the ex to view oh, the yeah. stuff together, which was... <laughs> they they a, insisted a, on it, yeah. actually, Ryan. Which was a and huge controversy the at the time for some places. And the trail, two cities on the trans trail, uh, the Birmingham... Birmingham and Memphis. And Memphis said, no, we're going to segregate our line, no matter what, going into the train. And so the uh, American Heritage Foundation that was behind the train 
said, okay, we're not stopping at your cities, and they didn't. And so that was that weighed heavily on their side. So what is the what out of all the research that you've done, what was the inspiration for the Freedom Train? Was just people just thought, hey, we need to really inspire these people, or we really need to come up with some positivity, so we'll, we'll come up with this idea. What was the inspiration for it? Well, uh, it started in uh, in Washington, although it wasn't uh, ultimately was not a government project. But a man that worked for the Justice Department, William Koblenz, he used to spend his uh, his lunch hour over in the National Archives. And he happened to come across Hitler's last will and testament. And he thought, oh, my God, this is amazing. I think people should see what, uh, what a great opportunity that would be for people to see the kind of mind that Hitler was. Uh, and, and, uh, and it was all locked away, it was yeah, locked yeah. away in these buildings. You couldn't get at it. Right. And, and then not only that, of course, then that uh, grew into uh, his concern that people hadn't actually seen what inspired our country, what inspired the men who uh, created our country, the documents that, uh, that are living in Washington. But locked people, away. Yeah, locked away. People were. They travel to Washington now, but at that time there wasn't uh, the ability to be able to do that. But they didn't have the super highways and so forth. And the railroads were all beat to the devil after mm -hmm. fighting wars on two fronts, mm -hmm. so they were in bad shape at that time too. But though this guy Koblenz, he came up with an idea of taking a passenger car, turning it into a mini museum, and tagging it onto the back end of freight trains. They would go in and out of cities, then they'd uncouple the car on a siding. People could go over and look at it. And he wanted to have copies of all of these different documents inside for them to see it. Well, he sent that to Thomas Clark, which was the secretary general at that time, attorney and his general. Boss, attorney general yeah. at his time. And uh, said, here's my ID. I'm gonna, I want to call it the Liberty Train. And he said, we'd like to maybe appropriate maybe only like about $20,000. Of course, Clark looked at that and said, it might as well be 20 million because we're broke. The government hasn't anything for this kind of a deal. So what they did was instead, they put in a call to say, let's bring uh, civilian money into this. And they knew what that might do. That would kind of take the purity away because everybody's got an ax to grind. They thought this could really turn into something either great or it could be a monstrous flop. And so they contacted people like... Um, uh, what was it? The, Barney Balaban, who was uh, uh, an officer at um, uh, Paramount Pictures. So we, they got the media people. They got the uh, Thomas Darcy Brophy of the um, Advertising, Advertising Council. Council. Uh, they got, uh, who else was it? They had um, Skiaris, who was head of Universal the, Pictures. Pictures, right. They had uh, the um, TV guy. Uh, oh, um Anyway, I had a lot of people on this thing that were uh, outside that, could, that knew yeah. people, that knew bankers and that. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, let's instead of going for this little car tagged under the back of freight trains, let's make up a whole train. Let's do the whole nine yards. And so they did. And they approached the railroads and they said, uh, could we do this? And like we said, the railroads at that time had been beaten up because of the two wars they'd been fighting. And so but they said, hey. We need to buy our way back into the people's confidence. So, yeah, we'll put the train together. And so that's what they ended up doing. And uh, they got three coaches from uh, Santa Fe. They got a couple of coaches from New York Central. They had seven coaches all together. They gutted three of them and turned them into one long aisle on the inside, plated with armor-proof steel over all of the windows. And then they had three coaches on the back for the troops, for the 27 United States Marines that they got from the Navy mm -hmm. to guard this thing. He's a guy straight from combat. So <laughs> you got to realize how this was, they were really guarded. Mm -hmm. And the reason they made sure they were really guarded because these were original documents. There were no copies. It was original Constitution, original Bill of Rights, Washington's copy of the of the Declaration of Independence, the Magna Carta, the Magna Carta, the Gettysburg Address that Lincoln held in his hand and read at the cemetery when he gave the speech. It was that level of stuff. And then they even had the surrender documents from the Germans 
and from the Japanese that they signed on the deck of the of the Missouri uh, um, battleship in Tokyo Bay. And they had all these wonderful 130 plus documents, and they put them behind specially built lucite cases, plastic. The lucite was actually made for this. Every case was cut to the document's shape, and these were put in this one long aisle and kind of a zigzag going down the aisle. And it was all decorated inside, soft green, and special cooling was set up and needed how many thousand pounds of ice a day? About 4,000 4, pounds. pounds of ice a day 4, to keep the cool. Because mm -hmm. remember, every time this stops, it opens the doors. And all these people come in with 400 BTUs of uh, heat coming off of them as they walk down the aisles. And they were getting 9,000 to 10,000 people every day walking through these. Mm -hmm. The train would travel at night. It would stop during the day. Everything would set up. And all the people would line up. The lines lasted for blocks. But the train wasn't the only part of the deal. The train was kind of the rock star of the whole thing. But the rest of it was the, uh, the uh, rededication the re days. Yeah. So they uh, also established a um, uh, program where they, each town would have a rededication week. And each day of that week would be devoted to one segment of society. It might be farmers, if they were, say, in the Midwest, uh, mm -hmm. labor, education, women, veterans, uh, industry, that yeah. sort of thing. And uh, so they would ha they usually had a parade, and then there would be special radio programs. There would be special services on Sunday. Uh, there would be uh, special ceremonies during the week uh, at certain factories, that sort of thing. But this was established by the American Heritage Foundation. And they sent, sent in, they sent out ahead of the train, yeah, advance men mm -hmm. to every town that that train was going to stop at. And they had a regular package that they would hand the, the town, say, here's what you can do. Your uh, uh, collateral uh, material, flyers, the flyers, collateral flyers. material. Here's how to run a parade. Here's what we need from you. And the interesting thing about this, as corny as it sounds today, everybody back in 1947 bought into it. Mm -hmm. Even towns that said, hey, how come you're not coming to our flight? Well, we have can all certain towns we can go to. So mm -hmm. what would happen is cavalcades of automobiles from towns nearby would drive to the town where the train was stopping. And people would line the tracks just to catch it going by. 40 million people participated, contributed to this whole thing that lasted for 16 months, traveling in and around all of the 48 states and 300 plus cities and towns. I mean, that's just so amazing. And why do you think that it hasn't been as covered as, as it should be? Because like you said, there weren't novels on it. Nobody had really written about it or done research on it. Why do you think? Because it seems like at that point in history, like you said, everyone bought into it. If you have 40 million people viewing it, why do you think in this day and age, most people do not know about what that happened and what that was? I think it's just a matter of, you know, it lasted for 16 months and then we, uh, had other issues to deal with. The Korean War Korean suddenly War. came along. You had McCarthyism. You had uh, another election. Uh, and so I think, like anything, it goes out of people's heads. The news cycle kind of buried it mm -hmm. at that point. And, yeah. and uh, though uh, the documents and everything went back and they were displayed in the National Archives afterwards, but uh, the train was eventually broken up. The cars were sent back into service and repainted mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So physically, it disappeared. Off There was no follow-up to it. There was a, a uh, Freedom train in 1975. I was just about to ask about that, yeah. People and a, mm -hmm. a whole different piece. So Right, and that was celebrating the bicentennial. So yeah. that was, And I think that's what most people remember because, of course, more people are alive from that. But even that, you know, it's it came, it went, we had the bicentennial and time to move on. And was... the other thing too was that the Freedom Train inspired at least two other trains while it was on the tracks, while it was running over the all the tracks of 52 different railroads that they'd gotten permission to run across their mm -hmm. tracks. And same permission that a presidential train gets where all the switches are spiked open before it gets there and after it gets there, and a flagman at every crossing. And so it had all of that going for it. But the other thing it did, it inspired these two trains. 
Drew Pearson was a popular columnist at the time, and he'd been over to Europe and seen the terrible conditions people were living in <laughs> over there. And so he said, why can't we send these people some food? And this was before the Marshall Plan. And so he went back to California and says, let's start a boxcar from California heading north, heading west or east to New York and ship the boxcar of food over to Europe. Oh, it's not like a swell idea. Okay, the boxcar got volunteers. People came over and gave all sorts of stuff there. The newspapers picked it up. And, of course, in his column, he talked about it. And pretty soon another town says, bring the boxcar this way. Okay, so then they turned out and got a schedule of where it's going to be running along. And they let everybody know where that boxcar was going to be. Well, pretty soon that boxcar ended up as a train of 60 cars. And pretty soon another train started out in California on a different set of tracks. And eventually we had three trains mm -hmm. on three parallel tracks loading up volunteer food. And by the time they all reached New York and ferried their way across over to the docks and loaded on the ship to go over to Europe, they had $40 million worth of foodstuffs collected. Mm -hmm. And that all happened during the same time that the Freedom Train was on the tracks. And so you can imagine how things were at that, that particular time. And after that, besides that, it doesn't stop here. They had uh, Truman was running for the 1948 presidential election to get elected because nobody elected him. So he wanted to prove that he could make it on his own. Well, even his own party didn't think he could do it. Mm -hmm. uh, their their, uh, their nominating convention they used some of the Republicans, left some of their bunting and flags behind after theirs, and the, and the Democrats used those instead of spending money on additional decorations. You can imagine how bad that was because Truman was not a good speaker. He, he cut with his hands and talking like this and like a robot, so he wasn't very good at it. So he said, well, okay, I'd like to talk to the people. So why don't I take Roosevelt's old car, what was that called, the Bering... Uh, the Magellan. The Magellan, the Magellan yeah. which was Roosevelt's passenger car that he used to travel around the country. And that was an armor-plated passenger car with the glass window, windows were three inches thick, and it was able to hold a whole bunch of people, and it had elect its own electrical power. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hooked that up to a train with the press and everything. And he went and set off. Well, Dewey said, hey, if he can have a train, I want a train. So Dewey got a Liberty train. And they both went across those tracks. You can imagine what the railroads must have been going nuts at this point. All these tried to get scheduled for here and scheduled for there and this train and that train. But they, Truman was able to stand on the back platform of the Magellan and talk face to face to people mm -hmm. and get like screen time today. It was the television of its time because there was no television to speak of at that time. And he talked to these farmers about plowing because he'd plowed. He'd walk behind a mule for crying out loud. And uh, so he knew all about that. And so he he won over that rural section. And the, the Crowley and Cry course around Harry became give him hell, Harry, because he had no problems with uh, <clears throat> using words that you couldn't use anywhere else. Yeah. And that train moved across yeah. and he won the 48 election. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's it, was just, it was just the, the, the face time. It was uh, and the fact that he could relate to what they did. He wasn't talking at them. He was talking with them. And he also was he also did a lot of talking about the freedom train. He, he he kind of put his imprimatur on it that when it left Philadelphia, he also stopped on it during during his train stop. He went on it, made a speech off of its back platform. And when the train finished all of this, it pulled into his inauguration. So it was there was his inauguration. You know, he stage managed it just beautifully to accompany him there. And uh, poor Dewey, he never knew what hit him. Yeah, that's the infamous for anyone out there who might know. That's the infamous where there's the big photo of Dewey defeats Truman, where the, the polls came out way too early and people predicted that Dewey had won, but yeah. Truman had actually won. That's a little bit of hindsight in that. But when you, people were viewing the Freedom Train, was it free or did they have to pay a charge to go on it? It was free, totally free, although they did uh, donate. Some people started actually putting, you know, pennies and nickels yes. and, in, to, into... So they finally put a pins. can at the end of the, yeah. the last train and put a, a plastic bubble <laughs> over it, and people could put money in. And I think they gathered did like $37,000 in just uh, donations just yeah. dropping in. Well, the towns did have to pony up something. They had, the, well, first of all, they had security uh, people that they had to, and then they had the... Uh, 
uh, stands that they had to build and so forth. And they were expected to purchase some of the collateral material, like the Freedom Pledge plaques and uh, the um, good citizen pamphlets and so forth to pass out. They figured and, and, they figured about twelve hundred dollars was about an average at a time. I think so. Yeah, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, which was a lot then. I yeah, mean, that it was, was big, not, big money in forty-seven, yeah. but they they had no trouble gathering it then. And yeah. like I say, everybody, everybody they could turn on their radio and listen to Bing Crosby singing about the Freedom Train. Right. And Irving Berlin wrote a song about it. And uh, it was, and they also uh, when the um, while the Marines were guarding the train each day, they would take their uh the uniforms for them and take them and have them clean they usually of course got the meals and so forth so uh it was a uh, total community event total community cooperation and uh, they they loved it they had there was no argument about it at all one of the reporters that uh covered it in one of the towns said going into the uh down the aisle of the freedom trade with all of these Documents from the Magna Carta and a letter from Columbus to the, uh, the Queen Isabella, Queen, Is Queen Isabella, and all of the uh, all of these documents and objects too. They had the flag that flew atop Mart Suribachi in a case all of its own. And they had Ira Hayes. They got him and uh, a radio personality in New York, and he was one of the guys that actually was on the pipe that yep. put that. Yep, flag he was the Native up. American man who's it. Yeah, if, yeah, yes, if anyone's yeah, in it, yep, exactly. he raised the flag. Yep. But all of that stuff was uh, was part of this thing, and it was uh, uh, people. Or this reporter said, walking down that aisle, he says, it was like walking in a church. He said it'd be real quiet when the first people started walking. They start seeing these things with actual handwriting. You know, in World War II, one of the most famous documents there was was when uh, the Germans uh, suggested that people in Bastogne. They were yep. held, it's surrounded mm -hmm. by the Germans, and they said, surrender, or we'll just plow you under. And General McAuliffe scribbled the word, nuts. Yep. There was that piece with his ink, mm -hmm. nuts. And it was a, yeah, it had things that everybody could touch to. They, they, when they saw those Marines, even, they saw their own sons and daughters that had died over there, that died over there or managed to come back. And so there was then that personal yeah. element of it. Yeah. A lot of tears were shed in that uh, those cars. My uh, my great uncle served in. He was in Bastogne and he was wounded at Aachen when he was oh, when he yeah. when he fought in World War II. Yeah. So yeah, he's so yeah. That's that's a really cool thing. So yeah, he always told me the story about that when I was when I was a young kid about the whole nuts when when he said that to him and I just oh, I, really? I always thought that's one. I always thought that's one of the coolest <laughs> responses that anyone's ever had to any to any surrender order ever. But yeah, that's, that's just so awesome. But out of all the research that you guys did into this too, what was one fact that you think surprised and shocked you more than any other? I think what surprised me anyway, was the way that every town bought into it. Uh, I mean, I think today I'm not so sure you'd be able to, to uh, repeat, repeat this sort of thing that you'd be, there'd be uh Officials that would say, well, I don't know, we can't afford it or we don't have time. We can't get enough volunteers. Uh, I, there was something about it. There was just it just brought together the whole spirit. of. And the thing is, too, this wasn't like a, the museums today that are have all the bells and whistles and buttons you can push and things that uh, that move and so forth. This was just their documents. And they came and they looked at these documents and they. Everybody was so impressed, and they waited in line for like hours. Mm -hmm. You'd think they'd give up after a while, but no, they did. As a matter of fact, uh, in um, when the train stopped in Brooklyn, there were a number of teenage girls that were just kind of standing there waiting and waiting for hours. Big number. Yeah, and uh, of course, they're all made up and everything. When when you went out in those days, you wore girls wore skirts and blouses and dresses and you and gloves and so forth. So they're standing in line and getting kind of bored. So they decided to kiss it. And the train, had, the train had three stripes going down the locomotive. Yeah. And red, white, and blue. And they all kissed the red stripe. The white, the white stripe. White stripe. The white stripe. And this Marine guard that was watching the thing yeah. uh, came back on duty late in the day and looked up, and the, the white stripe had disappeared under thousands uh -huh. of lipstick kisses. Yeah. So that they, like I say, 
it. They really embrace the whole thing. I mean, it's just such a fascinating topic. And when you guys were doing your writing, I mean, how long did this novel take for you guys to complete? What was the writing process like for you guys? Okay, well, first of all, it was, it's, it's not, nonfiction. Not, yeah. It's nonfiction. It's oh, nonfiction. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Selling Americans on America. Yeah, we had, we'd struggled with the, with the title for quite some time. Um, how long did it take us? That's pretty close to three years. We, we worked on it about three years off and on, yeah. I think. Yeah. But we had other books we were working on at the same time. Yeah. And so it was, uh, but it was one that we'd always come back to, or we'd mm -hmm. be taking, you'd go to the library and you'd get newspapers from all these different towns mm -hmm. that had stopped at, and they all had headlines and the freedom trains coming and the, what they're doing and all that. So we had plenty of research and it was a matter of selecting the research mm -hmm. that worked and uh, and that that also reflected the status of the country because in each one of the the book treats each area that the, the uh, train ran through in its own section like the middle middle west the west the east coast the uh, southwest and then and the towns in there and it talks about what was going on in that town like down in the southwest in texas they had the mexican broceros down there that they were having uh, uh that they were being mistreated and they uh, up in the east, of course, they had the st strikes in Pittsburgh, the steel companies, and that they were they were having to be dealt with. San Francisco, the internment of the Japanese mm -hmm. during the war, they were coming back to their homes and coming back to nothing because they own nothing. So that was a whole big issue at that time in San Francisco. So every part of the United States had its own problems it was mm -hmm. working with, and the freedom trade. <laughs> I had this line coming off of no matter what the problem was, mm -hmm. for the time that they were in the freedom train and for the time they were part of the re their dedication day, it was kind of like a truce was called. And everybody, straight guys, could go down, stand in line, uh, and no problem with that. So it was a, uh, it was it really helped unify the country, I think. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it really yeah. pulled everything together. So when the Korean War came along and the stuff, and then eventually in the 60s, a lot of the people that had lived through that particular time, everybody that saw it never forgot it. The people mm -hmm. that saw that train, uh, people my age, uh, even though I was I was only seven, eight years old when it went through, uh, they remembered. They remember what it was all about. Oh, the, oh yeah, all those documents. And so it, it, it had a uplifting effect in an individual way mm -hmm. with every person that looked at it. You know, there was one woman in, um, I think it was in the state of Washington, as she went through it, she said, boy, she said, I bet the damn Russians don't have anything like this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah they let a person, so, in a, in, and also in, in uh, about that same area, they, uh, the local uh, state prison, they voted and they voted one guy to go see the train and brought forward report back to him. Yeah, so they put they, a good new they, suit they on him. him a suit, yeah. <laughs> and this, so this prisoner got taken to the Freedom Train, and he walked through it and everything like that. And then he had to give a report to the rest of the key guys yeah. in the prison what it was yeah. all about. Uh-huh. Is there a documented, like, exactly, like, the route that it took where it, like, traveled all over? Did it did it have, like, a set path? Or, like you said, when cities oh, yes. and towns just wanted it to come, did it change so routes it, often, it, or was it all set in stone? It, it was set in stone yeah. before the train left. And if you look at the map of the train's travels, because they also had to think about weather. So in like in Minnesota, you didn't want to be there in December. Yep. Oh, that was because summer or the springtime. They went through the north and across the top of the Dakotas and everything. And the same thing down around the south because of the heat and all that. The temperature had to be carefully controlled on these documents. So that's why they had to use all of that ice. And so it was a uh, really plotted out very carefully on those on the train's travel so that it goes around and then it comes back and crisscrosses a couple of times. But they always managed to get the weather mm -hmm. pretty decent. They had rain. People would stand in the rain. It rained all day and they'd stand out there and wait for their turn to get into the train. To there sit. was one guy that even came in from Canada and he was standing in line for a long time. And then, but according to uh, his uh, pass or passport, he had to be back in Canada by a certain time. And so uh, he said, you know, can I, can I get in ahead? And uh, nobody paid much attention to him. So he went and he called the local radio station. He said, 
Can you just let people know that I'm just trying to get on the train and just see the documents I've got to get going? And uh, they did. They let them on. <laughs> so that is just, again, that is just so fascinating. It, that, and it's one of those things where being a history minor myself, I was so shocked that I wasn't able, that I didn't have any prior knowledge to this. But I, it's just such a great topic. And where can people find this book? Is it on Amazon? Is it on all these other it's websites? It's on Amazon. Yep. 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 It's on Amazon. You can get either an ebook or a uh, or the or the or, paperback, or the paperback book that, yeah that you it's, have yeah selling americans on america journey into a troubled nation selling americans on america journey into a troubled nation i'll leave a link to all of that stuff down below and when, uh lastly i love that so do you have any future projects that you're currently working on right now or any any uh projects that you're thinking about writing about now Oh, uh, well, we've got three books we just released uh, in the month of August. Yes. Wow. This, this one and a book called Ghost Army, Conning the Third Reich. And that's about the 23rd specialty troops. There were a bunch of uh, artists, artists, uh, uh, artists, sound radio technicians. people, sound technicians. Were those there? the ones that helped fake the D-Day landing? Were they helped fake where it was going to go so it tricked did, the Germans? That was yep. just one part of yeah, what oh, okay, they yep. yeah. And the whole thing started actually in uh, in North Africa with the British. And then the Americans adopted it and took it into Europe. Then they kept the Germans schooled all the way across Europe up to the crossing of the Rhine River. And these were all non-combatants. They had 1,100 guys, and they had to imitate a 30,000-man division. Jeez. And they did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Many times. And, and what's the other book that you guys that. have coming out? Yeah, That's out now. Or what's the other book? Because you said you released three. So the, third that was- one is, uh, the third one is my debut novel, A Thread of Sand. A Thread of Sand, and it's a uh, it's a novel. It's a the action adventure uh, uh, romance, erotic romance actually, uh, novel. And uh, the publisher helped me a lot with that a little bit. But anyway, it's a uh, it's a great yarn, and it's got a terrific uh, heroine. It's uh, got a got a lady in it who's the boss, not uh, not a guy. Kind of a not quite as as a uh, energetic as Lara Croft, but in her own right, <laughs> in the 1890s she was a pistol, and I've got the sky. I'm working on the sky, the sequence to it, the ski- sequel to it now. Mm-hmm. And that's so awesome. And again, I'll leave a link to all those books down below. So if anyone's interested, I highly recommend that you go and check out these books. And as someone personally myself, before I wrap things up here, I got to say, I've seen the Declaration of Independence. I went to Independence Hall and saw all those documents that in mm-hmm. Washington. And then I also saw where the Declaration was signed. I mean, you just get a certain feeling when you're in those areas. I mean, you just feel just different just knowing that you're that close to something that's been that important historically and i just can't imagine what it was like for that to be traveling to maybe someone's hometown and having them view it on a train so again just such a fascinating topic and we cannot thank you guys enough for coming on and sharing that with us and again you guys i'll leave a link down below for anyone interested in buying these and i highly highly recommend that you do but again thank you guys so much for coming on i really really appreciate it thank you ryan it's been our pleasure ryan absolutely so this is ryan johnson dd on the spot signing out have a great day everyone